Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So the first thing I want to cover is just our popular understanding of what debate and cross-examination is, what it's for, um, what we think it's for, what it is in the popular imagination. I think that that helps a lot of times when you're really confused about like what you're doing, just to kind of get back to basics. Uh, then I want to drill down a bit and cover a broad set of areas about what the three minutes of time is for and what you do, which is academic policy debate. It's a very particularized kind of cross-examination. We're going to do some do's and don'ts after that. Um, then I'm going to do different speeches. So like, hey, what do I do when I'm cross-examining the 1AC? And then I'm going to drill down a little bit on particular strategies. So one thing that I'm doing this year with the cross-examination talk that I didn't do in past years is to actually talk about how to interrogate evidence that I think is the most important part of cross-examination, is interrogating evidence. And when you struggle in cross-examination, it's because you struggle on how to do that. You have to do that in your speeches. You really have to do it in your rebuttals. And you've got to start doing it in cross-examination. And then at the end, I'm just going to give you a couple of exercises or things that you can do um, that are tips for practice. So we have conventional ideas about cross-examination. What are they? Unfortunately, my image here is uh, cut off because, I don't know, I'm not so great with the tech sometimes. But this guy on the left who's decapitated is Atticus Finch. Anyone? Show of hands. Who, are we still reading To Kill a Mockingbird? All right. So boring. Okay, good, good, good. That was a, see, you fell into the reverse pit of doom. I actually love To Kill a Mockingbird. It's one of my favorite books. Um, and I said something the opposite of it. It was controversial. I provoked a response, and now we actually agree. True case. I love To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, and of course, the story, for those of you who may not have read it, Atticus Finch, He's our, he's our hero in some ways, and in a lot of ways, it's an iconic idea of cross-examination. Yeah? Um, he exposes witnesses um, as, as liars or shading the truth. It's coded by racism um, for a terrible crime. Except guess what happens? Still convicted, right? Still, still convicted. The best cross-examinations ever are these kind of Atticus Finch moments that we have, yes? You do debate because it, it, it's attractive to you. You want to be a certain way. You want to learn a certain mode of thinking. Um, you want what Atticus seems to have. And so our idea about cross-examinations are they are these withering questions that you are totally dominating. And of course, what happens, um, you say, doesn't in fact your plan cause the worst thing ever? And your opponent says, you got me. You're right. They cry into their soup. They run from the room. The judge signs a ballot or you know, tabs in the ballot, writes 30s. You win. This is not what happens um, in cross-examination. In fact, if this, if this ever happens, um, I, I've never seen it. I've never seen it. So I want to talk. I want to show a little video about what we think our ideal cross-examinations are. Um, let me see if I can get there. Yes. That's correct. But the truth, so hope you got it. I do. Be seated. You see it here? Ms. Woods, you may begin your questioning. Um, Watching a lot of films this morning. First of all, I would like to point out that not only is there no proof in this case, but there's a complete lack of um, mens rea, which by definition tells us that <laughs> there can be no crime without a vicious will. I am aware of the meaning of mens rea. What I'm unaware of is why you're giving me a vocabulary lesson when you should be questioning your witness. Yes, Your Honor. Um, Ms. Wickham, when you arrived back at the house, um, was your father there? Not that I saw, but like I said, I went straight upstairs to take a shower. And uh, when you came downstairs, what happened? I saw Brooke standing over his body, drenched in his blood. Um, uh, but Mrs. Wyndham didn't have a gun. No, she'd stashed it by then. We can strike that from the record, Gerald. It's speculation. So stricken. Um, Miss Wyndham, did 
Did you hear a shot fired? No, I was in the shower. Okay. So, sometime in the 20 minutes that you were in the shower, your father was shot. I guess. Your father was shot while you were in the shower, but you didn't hear the shot because, um, because you were in the shower? Yes. I was washing my hair. Where's she going with this? Have a little faith, Trevor. Doesn't have a little more how much time they get for. Um, Miss Wyndham, what had you done earlier that day? I got up, got a latte, went to the gym, got a perm, and came home. Were you got in the shower? I believe the witness has made it clear that she was in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Your Honor. Um, Miss Wendell, did you ever gotten a perm before? Yes. How many would you say? Two a year since I was twelve. You do the math. You know, a girl in my sorority, Tracy Marcinko, got a perm one. We all tried to talk her out of it. Girls weren't a good look for her. She didn't have your bone structure. Oh. But thankfully, that same day, she entered the Beta Delta Pi white t-shirt contest where she was completely hosed down from head to toe. Objection. Why is this relevant? Oh, I have a point, I promise. Then make it. Yes. Um, Jenny, why is it that Tracy Marcinko's curls were ruined when she got hosed down? Because they got wet? Exactly. Because isn't it the first cardinal rule of perm maintenance that you're forbidden to wet your hair for at least 24 hours after getting a perm at the risk of deactivating the ammonium thiglocalate? Uh, yes. And wouldn't somebody who's had, say, 30 perms before in their life be well aware of this rule? What? And if, in fact, you weren't washing your hair, as I suspect you weren't because your curls are still intact, wouldn't you have heard the gunshot? And if, in fact, you had heard the gunshot, Brooke Wyndham wouldn't have had time to hide the gun before you got downstairs, which would mean that you would have had to have found Mrs. Wyndham with a gun in her hand to make your story plausible. Isn't that right? She's my age. Did she tell you that? How would you feel if your father married someone who was your age? You, however, had time to hide the gun, didn't you, Chetney? After you shot your father. I didn't mean to shoot him. I thought it was you walking through the door. Oh. had this kind of redhead thing going on down there, you know? I mean, what, what is up with that? This is an example of the worst of cross-examination, and it's what I hear as a judge often. You know, it's what I hear as a judge often. The first, I would say, two or three minutes of this video, terrible, right? And it's like, get to the point. You're asking the same question over and over again. So what's she doing wrong in the beginning? She's asking the same question over and over again, getting the same answer. <coughs> It's getting her nowhere, and at the very beginning, if you go back and rewatch this video, at the very beginning, she's blowing the rules. Okay, she doesn't understand the rules of the game. She's it's a it's a mens rea, and the judge has to go in and help her out and intervene and be like, hey, you got the rules, you got the rules wrong, you know, or yes, or, or yes, we know. So she's both rehearsing the rules in her own head to make sure she's got them right. She's boring her audience. It's not working. Okay, so this whole notion of the cross-examination with the witness melts, and then she flips it, right? She flips it with her own, with what? With her own knowledge. Okay, so that's kind of the, the best of cross-examination. Um, but I wanted to show it to you as like a, an example of, hey, this is what you're usually doing in debates. You're looking like Elle Woods. You're repeating, you're repeating, you're repeating. I want to show you another video about what cross-examination really is for. This is from a movie I like called Thank You for Smoking. And this is a scene, uh, show of hands, who's seen Thank You for Smoking? 
you, what are you doing? You have to go see this movie like tomorrow. You have to see Thank You for Smoking. So here's a setup, just a frame of the clip. Nick Naylor is a spokesperson for Big Tobacco, okay? And so he's talking a lot about uh, how cigarettes are really not that unhealthy and nobody's really proved this. And he's got this kid named Joey Naylor. And Joey's a son and he wants Joey to grow up and learn the right way and all this stuff. Joey's got issues with his dad's occupation, okay? And he takes Joey to learn more about his occupation as a tobacco spin doctor out to California for a trip. Right? And they're over here um, after he's just after Nick has just sold his soul to the devil in some ways. He's over here um, talking to Joey about why he does what he does, and uh, Joey's questioning him. So what happens when you're wrong? Uh, Joey, I'm never wrong. But you can't always be right. Well, if it's your job to be right, then you're never wrong. But what if you are wrong? Okay, let's say that you're defending chocolate, and I'm defending vanilla. Now. If I were to say to you, vanilla is the best flavored ice cream, you'd say... No, chocolate is. Exactly. But you can't win that argument. So, I'll ask you. So you think chocolate is the end all and be all of ice cream, do you? It's the best ice cream? I wouldn't order any of it. Oh, so it's all chocolate for you, isn't it? Yes, chocolate is all I need. Well, I need more than chocolate. And for that matter, I need more than vanilla. I believe that we need freedom and choice when it comes to our ice cream. And that, Joy Naylor, that is the definition of liberty. But that's not what we're talking about. Ah, but that's what I'm talking about. But you didn't prove that vanilla was the best. I didn't have to. I proved that you're wrong. If you're wrong, I'm right. But you still didn't convince me. I said I'm not after you. I'm after them. <laughs> Huge deal in debate. If you learn nothing else, okay, if you learn nothing else, you're not after your opponent, okay? And cross-examination is the only time in the debate where you're really explicitly talking to each other. You're not after your opponent. How many times do I see like, uh, oh, I don't know, death stares? You know, like someone really burning a hole through the brain of, of, the, of the opponent, trying to hammer and repeat something, or get really stuck or locked in an argument, but you're not after them. If you look at the argument that Nick has with his son here, right? The son is like, it's, it's vanilla versus chocolate. An irresolvable question. Fun fact, so is the resolution. The resolution is not something you will resolve for all time in a very particular debate. We make a provisional resolution, we make a provisional solve on that when we're talking. So Nick, and he's talking to his son, introduces a real interesting cross-examination technique, which is a pivot. Okay, so he's going back and forth on vanilla and chocolate, and then he just introduces liberty out of nowhere, yeah? Um, he's like, we're not talking about liberty. He's like, I'm talking about it, right? And it's important to who? The, to them, right? And who's the them in debate? The judge, right? It's always, it's always the judge. Back to my slides. So the basics on cross-examination, we call it a formal interrogation of a witness to challenge or extend the testimony of a witness. Your, that's a formal legal definition. Your less formal one is the, what you most likely do, which is an aggressive or detailed questioning of someone. But I think you see elements of the formal legal one in better and worse practices. It's three minutes long. Everybody knows this or should know this. So for the newbies in the crew, you get three minutes for cross-examination. This means every time you get up and ask questions, you are on a clock. 101, that means when you stand up to ask your questions, bring a what? Bring your timer or your phone, your computer. Some, that clock needs to be running and you need to be looking at it. 202, for those of you who are more experienced, bring your timer and also bring an agenda in your head. So if you want to cover questions about the case, um, a solvency argument, and get a link to a disadvantage, always be looking at that timer in your hand and see where and see how much time you got left to go, go, go. If it gets to be a minute on the timer and you need to get to set up your counter plan argument or you need to set up your link to your critique, you've got to move on and you've got to pivot there. Um, and the order generally for cross-examination 
if you aren't making the next speech, speech you're asking the questions of this speaker. Okay, so uh, when the 1AC speaks, um, the 2NC cross-examines that person. That's the easy way to remember for the newbies and the crew, uh, when, do I, when do I ask the questions? And I'll post these so that's your basic deal. The 2N asks the 1A questions, the 1A asks the 1N questions, when the 2AC gives his or her speech, the 1N cross-examines that person. And then the second affirmative speaker cross-examines the second negative. And these will be posted. One more reminder, who's cross-examination for? Yeah, so everything that is for you is really for the judge. So it's for you, but it's only insofar as you can use that for the judge. So if you make a sweet argument in cross-examination, does the judge count that? No. Not really. The judge remembers it, but the, it doesn't count until it's what? It's in the speech. How many times do I hear a 2N cross-examining a 1A? They're scoring two, three, four points on the case. The 1A gets up there, they debate the case, and what do they do? They read a Word document. I don't like that as a judge, all right? I mean, I like smart arguments and I like understanding that people are listening. And I like understanding that the team is working together, okay? So if you score a bunch of points in your cross-examination, take 15 seconds to talk to your 1NC to make sure that they get the speech. Purposes, bless you. So our, I've got five main purposes of cross-examination. They're not terribly complicated. This is more like a table setting deal for you to do your own work after the lecture. So it's a clarification, just knowing what the heck is going on. There's the L. Woods from Legally Blonde moment, so showing that your opponent is wrong, exposing them, winning the day. There's our deal over here, which is uh, setting up our arguments. I think that was Iman's question. Do you want to get up on the board? I call that preview of coming attractions because your judge knows where you're going with this or should know. There's getting admissions. And then there's, of course, your other basic one at the bottom, which is chewing up the time. You, you've got to take all this time. So first one. Clarification and getting information. Everybody needs this, I think. I, I've been debating and or judging debates for decades, and I miss things. I still miss things, and I miss things at all levels. And cards on the table, it's because my attention flags sometimes. It's because uh, the debaters are, are simply unclear at a moment or two. Sometimes you get the words, I understand the words that are coming out of your mouth, but I don't understand what they mean. What is she saying? And sometimes I just whip on the words, you know, like someone's made an argument, a 2AC, I, this especially happens when a 2AC is debating topicality. Um, those T blocks are so short and fast, rip, 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 rip. And so it's nine arguments, but I got five or six of them. It's A-OK -okay to ask for the other side's evidence and their blocks and speech documents. You should get them. You should ideally have them before the speech begins, but you can't rely on them. That's really just a check. And you know, it's an open question whether you should even be looking at them. I don't know that they're more helpful to figure out what's actually going on in the speech. You should use cross-examination to fix your flow if needed and to get important <coughs> evidence. I wouldn't spend the entirety of my three minutes doing this. But you can't beat what you don't know. So if you're unsure of a particular link to a disadvantage, if you don't understand all of the impact scenarios to the 1AC, <laughs> um, you've got to be able to make sure that you capture all that. <coughs> Bless you. You can clean up, fix your flow in a couple of ways. One is you can check with the person who gave the speech during cross-examination. Right? Hey, what's your number this? What's your number that? Second tactic for this is hand your flow to your partner. 
So the 2nc can help the 1nc fill in case arguments. If I'm the 1n, I get up, I rip off seven, seven case arguments against their solvency cards. But I don't have them written down, but I need to debate them later. Um, my partner's back filling that flow. When the 2a is up cross, getting cross-examined after his or her speech, the 1a should be back filling that flow, making sure that it's complete. They should always be working. Whenever I judge a debate, I should always see the 1a working on something, preparing speech and flow. Yeah? Great. So if you're asking questions, your partner's back flowing for you, or are you back flowing for your partner, or filling in theirs while they're prepping? So the last one that I talked about was when the 2a is being cross-examined. Okay, so he or she is answering questions about the speech. The 1a should be helping complete the flow for the 2a. Otherwise, you just got you get up there and you've got like question marks and whatever on your page. So you don't and you don't. And the other thing about the other thing about that that's really important is show of hands. Who here in the debate is given a speech and they prepared a speech? But then they just start saying stuff that pops into their heads during the speech. Yeah, so the speech doc ain't all that. Judges, I don't look at the speech document, you know? So like the debaters have what they think the speech is. I don't have it. I'm not looking at it. I'm just writing things down. And so the way you're framing something, the way you're explaining something matters for rebuttals. And it needs to be written down the way you said it. So that's why you need some help with that. All right, the second one is showing your opponent to be wrong. I got a fun one for this. Oh, we didn't look at this one, but I want to show. This is, uh, this is how you usually look in cross-examination. Mr. Paul. <laughs> Do you know my client is an ethical? Yes. that your relationship with my client is entirely platonic? I object, Your Honor! To yourself? <laughs> yeah. But I would like to rephrase the question. Uh, Mr. Falk, would I be accurate if I described your relationship with Mrs. Cole as totally professional? I object, Your Honor, and I move to strike! Mr. Reed, I don't know what you're on, but you better get to the point and quick. Is your relationship with my client entirely platonic? No! It's not your relationship with my client, boy! Did you ever not make a laugh? Did you? Mr. Reed! You had sex with her every time you met, didn't you? His witness. You slammed her, you dumped her donut, you gave her dog a sausage, you stuffed her like a Thanksgiving turkey! Oh, oh, oh. All right, all right, it's true, okay? I hooked your brains up. There, now you're happy? <laughs> no further questions. So Jim Carrey's lawyer, yeah, what did he do? He freaked out, right? Because he couldn't tell, in this particular film, another classic, um, every debater should see Liar Liar. Every debater should see Liar Liar. Um, he's a lawyer who all of a sudden is afflicted with the disease of not being able to tell a uh, lie. And so he's stuck. He knows what he thinks is the truth, right? Um, and he's conflicted about that. You have to give yourself away from that kind of mentality. You, know, you, have to, you have to move away from that. But it is how you look sometimes in cross-examination. And I want to just say, where L. Woods bored the judge to tears, this guy over here, you know, what are you on, right? The judge, by the way, I, the 90s also had a thing about race where every judge had to be black because no judge was black. I just want to point that out as well. Like These are very odd cultural, uh, odd cultural times. We I mean, you notice that too with both Legally Blonde and Liar Liar. Um, audience matters. So, so the judge is annoyed, right? The judge is annoyed, and what are the witnesses doing? Rolling their eyes. What is he getting at? 
But you can still expose your opponent sometimes to be wrong. And I had a good one on that. Yeah, here we go. Another film that every debater needs to see is My Cousin Vinny. If you learn uh, nothing else in this lecture, you need to learn all the films that you have to go back and stream. I feel like that last one was the most known to court right there. You saw the defendants. Oh, yeah, so, he, so a little setup, a little yeah, setup for one. my cousin Vinny. Um, two youths are driving through Alabama, and they're from New York. And they pull into a convenience store, and they want to buy some stuff, and then they drive away. Well, it turns out that the convenience store clerk was murdered, and they were arrested. And they're in trouble. They don't know anybody in Alabama because they're from New York. So they call, you guessed it, my cousin Vinny, who just recently passed the bar and has never done a murder trial, but he knows a little bit about the law. And here he is, finding his way in court, interrogating a witness. And when you saw the defendants, were you wearing your glasses? What she saw. Yes, I was. Over here, dear. Would you mind putting your glasses on for us, please? Whoa, how long have you been wearing glasses? Since I was six. Have they always been that thick? Oh no, they, they got thick over the years. So uh, as your eyes have gotten more and more out of whack as you've gotten older, okay. how many different levels of thickness have you gone through? Oh, I don't know. Over 60 years, maybe 10 times. Maybe you're ready for a thicker set. Oh, oh no, no, I, I, I think they're okay. Maybe we should make sure. Let's check it out. Now, how far were the defendants from you when you saw them entering the sack of suds? About a hundred feet. A hundred feet. Would you hold this, please? Thank you. Sorry. Excuse me. Excuse me. Sorry. Sorry. Okay, this is 50 feet. That's half the distance. How many fingers am I holding up? Let the record show that counselor's holding up two fingers. Your Honor, please, huh? Uh -huh. Oh. Sorry. Now, Mrs. Riley, and only Mrs. Riley, how many fingers am I holding up now? Oh. What do you think now, dear? Thinking of getting thicker glasses. Thank you. This is Riley, when you saw All right, so this is actually an incredible cross-examination. I want to check this off over here. We wanted to talk about maintaining control without seeming like a jerk, right? So we got two clips here. We got Liar Liar, uh, Jim Carrey, who is, I wouldn't say he's a jerk. He seems like a jerk. <laughs> but he's, he, we don't know that he's afflicted with this condition of having to tell the truth. His audience doesn't understand that either. So he, he's trying to maintain control, but can't. Elle Woods is trying to maintain control, but she doesn't know the rules. She's a little bit stumbly. She has to hold on, and she doesn't find her footing until when? Until she hears about the perm, right, and why? Because she knows about the perm. Because she knows about the perm. And that's how she gets her way in, and the wet t-shirt contest, and her, her sorority sisters, and that's how she buys her way in to actually figure out what the heck's going on. Joe Pesci, you know, he's got to defend two youths. He's an outsider, he's from New York, Alabama, is the judge, uh, who is uh, Fred Gwynn, who was Herman Munster um, in the 60s classic show. You've got to check it out. Um, and as makes a wonderful performance here as the, as the judge. He's kind of corrupt. He's been, given, he's been given Joe Pesci's character such a hard time the whole time that he doesn't know the rules. Notice how Pesci persists in a kind of friendly way, you know? He converses with the witness. He calls, he says, and he says these strange but leading things. Why don't we check? Right? Why don't we check? He doesn't say, aren't you wrong and aren't you in fact blind as a bat? He says, how thick are those glasses? How many times have you gotten those, that, those your prescription checked? Maybe we better check right now. 
Let's go look. And he doesn't say, you're wrong, get out of the courtroom, when he's made his point. What does he say? Maybe it's time for new glasses. Yeah. So there are ways to get admissions from your opponent that don't involve going round and round about the conflict, about interpreting one line that you're not going to agree on. It's more performative than it is, and for the judge, than it is for, um, than it is for the debate. So the ways that you can show your opponent to be wrong in a debate are to expose major gaps in logic on important points. You can't get your opponent to admit that, that those gaps are there. You can't do that. You've got to be like Joe Pesci. You've got to be like Nick Naylor. You are performing that you believe there are gaps. And once you have exposed those gaps, the judge understands that if they're paying attention. You can also do the same for evidence. Much evidence, I would say, I would say close to 100% of the evidence that is read in a debate suffers from one or more of the following problems. Uh, close to 100%. It's labeled aggressively, and the evidence doesn't match the label. Close to 100% of the time in the debate. It is read in part, what we call highlighted, or underlined, or boxed, and the part that isn't read either contradicts what the tag is, like directly contradicts it, or just offers you fodder for qualifying really the conditions under which the tag is true, close to 100% of the time. So you can show your opponent to be wrong by exposing those fault lines and cracks in logic and using those in your rebuttal speeches. I will show you how to do that with a couple of examples at the end of our talk, like live evidence examples. I promise no films. But I got some more video for us. Yay. Third, you set up your own arguments. Purpose of cross-examination to set up your own arguments. This strategy tries to get explanations from your opponent that help an argument that you want to make. I've got three live examples of attempts at that. Right? L. Woods was trying to expose the witness. Jim Carrey didn't know what he was trying to do. He was actually representing his client, but misrepresenting once he elicited the infidelity. Yeah? Joe Pesci was trying to get the witness to admit that she couldn't see from 100 feet away. So you talk about a couple of strategies here, the pit of doom and the reverse pit. I'm going to check this off, because that was totally one of our things. What's the reverse pit of doom? Right? So the Pit of Doom asks you to get the opponent to answer questions that they must answer truthfully, and in so doing, give you links to set up your argument. Right? So here, which level of government needs to do plans in our topic this year? The federal government needs to do plans. So one way to set yourself up for a state's counter plan is to ask a series of questions that gets the affirmative to explain what? Why federal involvement is important and or necessary. That's doing double duty for you, right? They have to explain that, but you're also setting up the deal for state's counter plan, yeah? Or you can set up neoliberalism this way. You can reverse the pit. Get them to talk about their advantages on the food, uh, what's the, you know, the school lunches app, right? That school lunches app is pretty interesting. But at its heart, there are versions of it which ask us to say that we should be help we should treat kids from disadvantaged backgrounds in a more healthy way. And if we do, it'll be great because we can send them off to fight wars. So that's not necessarily great if you want to argue neoliberalism, right? It's good for you if you're neg, because the thesis of neoliberalism is that we use our students as means to an end, that there's a separation between the, those that were the elite of us and the people, and that we use elite expert economic discourse to use people and perpetuate systemic violence. So all you have to do to set up your links to neoliberalism is to get people to talk about how it is 
that ru expert rules and regulations change and shape the behavior of students in a way that's beneficial for our foreign policy. Those are links. So that involves asking just seemingly innocent questions like Pesci. How long you had those glasses, ma'am? Can you tell me more about your solvency evidence here? What, is it, what, is that, what does that say right there? How, well, they're going to follow these guidelines? Why do the students need guidelines to follow how to eat? Right? Get them to talk about their solvency evidence and use those words against them in your speech as link arguments. But fun fact, if it's in cross X, is it on the flow? Got to be in your speech. Got to be in your speech. Questions about doom pits. There are others, but those are just two quick examples of how to, add, to start orienting cross-examination questions so you can set up your arguments. Admissions. Fourth purpose, admissions. This doesn't happen like it does in the films. You're not going to get Linda Cardellini um, saying, it was me, I, was, uh, I had the gun, I shot him. I had sex with your client. I guess I can't see so good. You're not usually going to get that. And why? Because you don't have time. These movie clips are really long. <laughs> um, you don't have time, and you've got an opponent who is just like uh, seized up and is not going to want to give you an inch. But you can still get admissions without that big moment. Okay. If your opponent reads four, five pieces of evidence and, yeah, question. If your opponent doesn't know the answer to that question, can you basically just like stall, or would that be like their problem? Who would be stalling in that circumstance? Well, let's say you're the negative and you're processing the affirmative, and mm -hmm. then the affirmative like doesn't want to like answer, so you can just stall, right? If the affirmative is refusing to answer your question, it, de it depends on the question. Okay. If, if, if the affirmative can, I think, rightfully refuse to answer couple things. First of all, do, the only people who really can set the rules of cross-examination are who? Kind of, but not really. The judge only sets sort of real baseline rules about how long they are and tell you when time is up. The debaters are partially in charge of that. Remember what Joe Pesci did when the judge intervened? He said, Your Honor, please, right? So he actually, when the judge was intervening, kind of skid in and said, no, that's actually my spot. So the debaters have to set in there. So generally speaking, if they're, <laughs> if they're stalling, um, you've got to do a couple things. Move to something else, draw or draw an inference, say, look, if you don't have an answer to this, I can only assume the answer is, and then make your argument. So you at least use that opportunity to draw an inference in your favor. Another thing that you can do is get your opponent to admit that evidence they read makes certain assumptions. And you can do that by examining the evidence and putting it in front of them. Side, side light on this, though. Uh, how, who here has heard people say, uh, show me a line in, the, in this evidence? Show me a line in this evidence. Okay. Uh, I, I may be swimming upstream here. <coughs> I don't like that. <laughs> I, I, I think that that is one of the worst things that you can do. And here's why. When you ask someone to show you a line in the evidence, what are you inviting your opponent to do? Show you a line in the evidence. So what is any decent debater going to do? Go, no, they're going to go to their best part of the evidence and start arguing about why it's great. Or they're going to sit there and fumble around and, and do what, right? If they're lesser experienced, well, what evidence? I don't know. Uh, where are my pants? Are they on? Uh, let me scroll down here a little bit. And what's happening during that time? Tick, tick, tick. <coughs> you show me the lines in the evidence. You show me where the evidence falls short and ask leading questions of them. Make argumentative questions. Don't invite your opponent to show you to point to a line, because they'll always point to it. You show me. You control that and show me where they fall short. Fifth, time, time, time. This is an easy one. 
Cross-examination is simply a block of time. It's three minutes. You need to use it, and you need to use all of it, so your partner can get the time to prepare. So again, for those of you who are lesser experienced, if you're struggling for questions, have some prepared. At our tournament, you should know what your opponent is reading when they're affirmative. Prepare a few questions in the can. When you think you've prepared enough to chew up the three minutes, prepare three more. Just in case you misunderestimate. So return back to the 1AC. Ask them to explain their advantages. Be careful. <coughs> Don't give them the opportunity to just speechify on how great their advantages are. But if the alternative is them speechifying versus you, versus you just sitting down and losing that time, let them, let them talk. Better questions are questions about plan logistics, funding, implementation, relationship between states and feds, which levels of government make what decisions about the plan, what happens when there are conflicts and refusals, different interpretations. Try to dig into the plan a little bit. How much does your plan cost? Where does the dough come from? Um, where did, where, and if they say, oh no, uh, well, where does it typically come from? What kind of a plan? What, you know, what kind of a plan is it? Where is it where, how is it typically appropriated? You know, just try to ask questions that get them to say more about the plan. Because whenever they're ex saying more about the plan, that's a good thing for you. Because you can then hold them to it, use it, and argue that they can't move from it later. When you ask if you're trying to chew up that time. Ask the NEG to go back and explain those link and impact scenarios. All of them. You need all of them. Ask them more questions about how the counter plan can solve. How can the counter? We said that federal involvement's key because, <coughs> and then insert your argument. Your evidence doesn't account for that argument, does it? A dump of do's and don'ts. Don't let the answer go on forever. I think in Elle Wood's clip, um, she was going on for quite a while. Yeah, um, Linda Cardellini character and Linda that Legally Blonde, the first clip we saw. Boobity bobbity bee, and I was doing this. Um, you've got to get them, you've got to control them somehow. So what are some strategies for doing it? Um, one strategy is to assertively bring yourself up and thank them. Thanks, I, I, I understand the gist of that. I'd like to ask another question. Smile. Not like, oh god dang it, you, they won't shut up and I got stuff to do, right? Like that's that's what we read sometimes in body language. But thanks, okay, I've got that, but I've got another question. I'm sorry, I only have 20 seconds left and I really need to get this last one in. You know, that kind of pushes it back off on them. If they want to keep filibustering, they're not looking great, and then I would ask that question. Sometimes if you've got enough time and they're yammering on, you can body language it up and just sort of... Ten seconds of silence, if you can spare it, um, does a world. But again, you know, you've, got, you've got stuff to cover. But you've got to cut them off in some way. You know? And so I think thanking them for their answer, Smiling and moving on to another part, I think is a good call. Do listen to the answers and ask great follow-ups. Okay. Try this out the next time you're making a cross-examination. You might have a list of questions prepared. Say to yourself, my third question, no matter what the answer is, I'm going to try to go off my script and ask a follow-up. Just pick it at random the first time. Nobody cares. You're just getting good at this. It's an important skill in debate because sometimes people will give you good stuff. I see it a lot at all levels. You're getting stuff that is of great interest to who? Me, your judge. But you're not pursuing it because you've got an agenda. <clears throat> but you've got to remember Nick on the Ferris, you know, at the, at the amusement park. You're not after Joey. You're after them. Okay, so if you've got gold about what the plan does, wow, the plan does that? 
How can you say the current plan doesn't solve it when the plan does that? How can you say there's no link when the plan, you know, when the plan does that? So ask decent follow-ups about that. Always listen to your answers. Don't just check off what's going on. Don't be rude. I've got a nice example of rude. But I notice anytime anything wrong happens, I say they're wrong because they were wrong. And were they wrong? Are they wrong? I think they're wrong 100%. Sometimes they're wrong. They're wrong. Sometimes they're wrong. It's the New York Times. They're always wrong. Well, I would say my wife tells me I'm wrong all the time. Wrong. 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 That is too wrong. And he did the wrong thing. Wrong. That is absolute wrong. Proved over and over again. Wrong. The actual wrong. wrong. They were not hired. And the, here's wrong. why he does it this way. Let me explain why he does it. Wrong. Jeb is so wrong. He said no. Wrong. Jeb is so wrong. After having so wrong. Down the wrong. national debt. Wrong. 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 With that money wrong. being lost. Wrong. 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 Very nice words, but happens to be wrong. 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 Then wrong. We have one more question from Ken Bone about uh, energy policy. Ken? Ken Bone! Wrong. <laughs> but I noticed any time... That was So... A, a per I know, right? It's... I mean, you hate him, but, but you're laughing. You know? Because there's a part of you that thinks, boy, that's funny. Boy, I wish I had that kind of power. Boy, I wish I could tell somebody. Sorry, this is kind of where I get real a little bit on this. But boy, I wish that I could just tell someone else they were wrong, right? So be, not being rude, be, this is an important thing to remember when I say try not to be rude. Because a lot of times when we're rude, we are so because we're indulging a fantasy of power and authority. We're expressing, we're inhabiting this place where we can show to others they don't count, they don't matter, what they have to say is irrelevant. It's tough because debate, in some ways I think, instructs you to do that inadvertently. And I'm here to tell you that you should resist that. That there are ways to make you, that, that you need, on, while you're on your journey in learning, you need to try to find ways to make reasoned arguments without inhabiting the place of domination. There's a difference between control over the development of reasoning and domination. And you've got to resist, you just need to resist um, that, you just need to resist that desire, is all I can say. So different ways that I see that play out in debates, clearly um, when people aggressively talk over someone, um, when they are dismissing someone, um, when they are yelling, <laughs> when they, I mean, just yelling at another human being is, is not necessary in a debate. You have two people here, two people here, and a judge. We can hear. You know, we can hear. So different ways to just not be rude. Do reasonably insist on moving forward. You don't want to be like our, our, our current president and say, well, that's a, it's a nice point that you made, but as usual, you're wrong. <laughs> if, but if, you want, if you're getting filibustered, just insist on moving forward with the questioning. I appreciate that contribution. I've got one more thing to cover. I'd like to get to this because time is limited. You know, making acknowledgments to the constraints that we all live with in debate and in life will get you far, and it'll actually get you far in cross-examination. All right, third chunk. All right, so we, we got three topics here. We did general purposes, we had do's and don'ts. Third chunk is I want to talk to you about ways to ask smart questions about evidence. This, I think, is useful not only in cross-examination and maybe not even primarily in cross-examination. This is one of those skills that just moves with you in constructives, in rebuttals, in life. And I do this a little bit differently and weirdly. I understand that debate has a lot of jargon, and I'm going to give you a little bit more. I will apologize for that in advance. Please indulge me. Who here can tell me what the basic building blocks of an argument are? What, what is an argument? Yeah. 
Claim warrant evidence is kind of what we talk about. Is that familiar to everybody in the room, or most people? Have you heard that terminology? Okay. So, debate students often will get tripped up sometimes thinking about what a warrant is, right? They're like, I get what the claim is. You're telling me that something's on the brink. You're telling me that the plan's going to cause nuclear war. And, and I get what the evidence is. That's cards. We read them. What's the warrant? So here's what the warrant is, right? First of all, the warrants are the ones that need to persuade me. The warrants are the things that tell me that the cards that you read match up with your claims. So that's where all the debating is done. The entirety of it is not cards. I mean, you need the cards. Cards are necessary, but not sufficient to be a good debater. Warrants are where the action is. And so I want to just go over a few common warrant structures so that you can see them, these structures operating in the evidence and can ask sweet questions about them and then make those arguments in the speech. So I got a few. First one's an example. Some evidence argues by example. Bless you. And examples are warrant structures that, connects part, that connect parts and holes. And we have two types. And when I say parts and holes, think of a pie. I cut a pie into 10 pieces. I pick up one piece that's a part. I put it all in. Together, it makes a pie. So one type is the generalization warrant. Bless you. And that reasons from the minute, or the particular, or the part, and makes a grander claim. Right. So that's specific instances to a general conclusion. But you can also reason the other way. And that starts with your general principle and then zooms in on an illustration of it, connecting it to specific instances. If I'm moving too fast for the slides, I will slow it down, just be like, hey, you're moving too fast. But also remember, I will be posting these. A couple of prevalent patterns in debate evidence to look out for. One is the statistical generalization. Okay, so who here has heard about you hear uh, public opinion polls for politics links? Yeah, 22% of the population thinks <coughs> X. So yeah. that draws a sample of a larger popul population and argues that what's true of the tiny part is true generally. Another common example argument is the anecdotal generalization. So you have a series of stories or anecdotes. And this pops up a lot in the state's counterplan. AFTS will hear a lot of evidence saying states can do stuff in education. After all, my mom lives in Montana. And she's a teacher. And she did something good for students. And that was, in, that was at the state level. And so evidence will have an aggregation of different things that states can do to generate positive education outcomes. But you can put that stuff to the ringer. Have you really presented enough examples to support the generalization? Like if, if, if a piece of evidence talks about uh, my friend's mom in Montana and a pilot program in California, and an after-school program in Alabama, is that really enough evidence to prove that the states could competently do the plan? I don't think so. Now, the evidence, I'm mischaracterizing the kind of evidence that you'll, you'll see that a lot of negatives will read evidence better than that. But you get the general idea. You need to start pushing them on their examples. Are those examples diverse enough to prove the general claim? And the third one, which is always a great one that you can pop people on, is are there counterexamples? Debaters always slant evidence towards their favor. <coughs> they never, 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 never disclose things that are harmful to them if they can avoid it. So they'll highlight that stuff out. They'll, they'll shrink it to point to font. Then look at you with a straight face and tell you that's OK. Um, but you can use your head to generate counterexamples. And you'll have evidence that have counterexamples. Illustrations start with the general principle and use the example to illustrate it. And the effect of that is pretty persuasive because it makes that concrete. You know, so I can say, big government is ruining our lives. Let me tell you about my cousin. She had a small business. 
you know, and then it's here's the sob story about how my cousin's small business was undone by federal regulations. And so, dear listeners, all federal regulations are anathema. But we can ask questions of this, you know? We can ask whether my cousin's sob story is that her business went, she went out of business because of federal regulations writ large or because of a lot of different things. Does, does, does her case really belong in that category? Is her case exceptional? Yes, it's concrete, it's specific, it's particular, it may connect, but it doesn't mean it's representative. Who here watches TV? All right, so who here has seen uh, the stuff talking about uh, giving money to the to Humane Society and the poor pets, right? With the Sarah McLaughlin song and the, and, the sick, and the sick puppies. I have a dog, Tippy. I love her, she's a rescue. And she's the, great, she's the greatest dog. But, there's a question about whether those particular dogs are representative of all dogs. If you look at that commercial on its own, you would think that all, you know, you are moved to give because all dogs seem like they're like this. You know? So the question is, is that really representative of all dogs? Analogy, it's another common warrant structure. It argues that what's true of one set of data is probably true of the other. Right? So that instead of being from a part to a whole, this moves from specific case to specific case. Same kinds of tests. Are the objects being compared alike? Are they different in material ways? What are those differences? You need to ask these questions of the evidence. You need to ask those questions in cross-examination. You need to argue them. Is there a better analogy? So I have a text example here. I'll just read it really quickly. We're just going to pretend that this is a card. The United States has a problem with affordable childcare. <coughs> Far too many hardworking parents are unable to locate it. The result, this results in a drag on economic production and damages the development of our children. The US should follow Sweden's lead. Sweden guarantees affordable care to its citizens, resulting in a higher economic growth and a better quality of life. What two things in that paragraph are being compared? Sweden, Sweden United States. How might Sweden and the United States be different? Uh, population. Their population might be different. Their size might be different. Their economic structure might be different. Like Swedes, Sweden, I love the Swedes. Um, but, they, they, but they are a relatively homogenous population. They're more dedicated culturally to social democracy. Um, we, we have more, we're more, con we're more conflicted political liberals here where we, we like, we value economic freedom and industry. Um, there's a substantial strain of our population that buys into that ideology. So there's a question about whether these two cases are truly analogous, right? Same gig, same deal when you're asking questions about evidence. When you see two sets of data being compared, your buzzers should go off. How are, you know, you're drawing a conclusion about these two things. Are they really the same? What are the differences in those two things? Why do those matter? Those become arguments. They're not on their own round winners, but when cobbled together with your usual offensive arguments, they are. Cause. Every argument is a cause argument, isn't it? You know, every argument in debate says, on some level, that A leads to B leads to C, and on a pragmatic level, we should avoid that. Now, of course, um, critiques do something a little bit different, but we don't need to know that just yet. The simple pragmatic form is that doing X will lead to Y, and Y is desirable, <coughs> undesirable, the greatest thing, the worst <coughs> thing, but that's your general form. But there are lots of ways to attack evidence that's premised on causes. Sometimes evidence confuses a sign with a cause, okay? Let's say I open a door every day to, to leave the apartment, and every day, you know, I, uh, I, I get smacked in the face by a, a, an evil monkey, okay? That doesn't mean that my opening the door is causing the evil monkey to smack me in the face. The evil monkey may hate me, the evil monkey may stalk me at my workplace or be hiding in my car otherwise, 
opening the door is just a sign of another event. Post hoc. That's your second way that you can buy in. A starts first, then B. We presume that A causes B. Not ain't necessarily so. Uh, Georgia State hired Baruch to be a teacher there. And after that, the GSU football team uh, lost all their games the next season. Therefore, Baruch hired, Baruch should be fired um, because, uh, because he ruined the football team. Not necessarily so. Some evidence doesn't take into account common causes. Okay, so it treats two elements as cause and effect relationship where they're actually both caused by a third element. Okay, so um, this is a dark example, but I, it's the easiest one for me to explain. Um, there is literature tr that tries to prevent suicides, um, that tries to link or posit links between, say, alcoholism and suicide, and they'll make an argument that alcoholism causes suicide, but it may be the case that both alcoholism and suicide are not are effects of a first cause, depression. All right, so anytime that someone says A leads to B, it could be that A and B are both effects of a different cause. Push it. Sometimes people reverse cause and effect. The plan's gonna cause China to get mad. Maybe China getting mad is causing trade wars now, right? The, the disadvantages are, are often dancing that fine line. They, always confuse cause and effect. They're worried about preventing something that's being caused by, you know, where, where that is actually something that's, that's being caused by something different. There could be intervening or counteracting causes. That's a good one to use when the negative is, when the AF is, this came up yesterday in lab in a mini debate. Um, we were arguing about, uh, about racism and the social equity. And the AF was trying to say, look, um, you know, you gotta vote AF on social equity. But there are a lot of intervening causes that could act on social equity. It's not like the plan's the only thing that might act on social equity if the judge votes negative. So just different ways to get at cause arguments. Old dates and assumptions. Oftentimes teams read old evidence. Sometimes